So there's lots of metal, and there's lots of black metal, but there's only one true Norwegian black metal. For lack of a better way to say it, I think black metal fans are some of the most opinionated people that are into any kind of music genre. They could be described with several adjectives such as strong-willed, opinionated, fiercely loyal, traditionalist, nationalist, you know, all of these kind of archetypes and ways to describe the fans and many of the artists, it's very off-putting, beyond the extreme nature of the music, to even know how you're going to get wrapped up in this. And then you have a lot of newer bands creating this infighting with black metal fans. What is black metal? What isn't? But today, I'm not worrying about that. That's a discussion for other people to have in their online forums or in the pit of a show somewhere far, far away from me. I'm here to talk about one thing we can all agree on, and that is true Norwegian black metal. Specifically today, I'm making a drink dedicated to Mayhem, one of the most infamous bands I think of all time. If you know anything about black metal, chances are you know about the story of Varg and Euronymous. A lot of you might have also just clicked on this video having no idea what black metal is. You might think I'm talking about Kiss or some shit like that. So I guess to give a little bit of context, we need to jump back a little bit before Norwegian black metal to the 1980s. You really can't talk about black metal with at least first mentioning the band Venom. Venom released their sophomore album in 1982, which was titled Black Metal. And while the sound of the album wasn't really like what black metal developed into over time, they really planted the seeds for what the genre would grow into and at the very least defined the aesthetics of it. Clad in leather outfits with spikes all over them, with painted faces. You know, these aesthetics were not necessarily new to the metal genre, but it was more the attitude behind them that was what was shifting. Lots of metal artists before had played with things like Satanism and anti-Christian imagery, despite that they hadn't really lived through these kind of ideals, and they were much more of just an aesthetic thing, whereas Venom was the first group to really push that into being what the group was about. In fact, lots of the whole satanic panic that we would see during the 1980s for a lot of metal artists can actually be attributed to be true for black metal musicians. His mother says he was a normal happy boy, until he became obsessed with black metal music. Black metal music can be bought at many record shops carrying no warning. But Veronica Timms believes the music must be banned. Without that, she fears her son will not be the last to be sucked into committing sacrilege. And black metal music will leave its ugly mark in this country, just as it has in Norway. While a lot of black metal artists of the 1990s and beyond, and even prior, were using anti-Christian imagery, Satanist imagery, more often than not they were actually paganists, which more tying into their belief that Christianity itself was the plague. Christianity was destroying the history and a lot of the religious history of places like Norway and Sweden, which is why the whole sect of, uh, you know, Norwegian and Scandinavian black metal grew to be so extreme. So black metal kind of worked in waves, and Venom launched the first wave, which saw artists from Scandinavia and a lot of other places joining in, but we didn't see this idea of black metal as it was seen through the eyes of bands like Dark Throne, Emperor, Immortal, and yes, even Burzum. Of course, Burzum, like many, many black metal musicians, is one of the much more polarizing ones to say the least. And that is leading down the whole path of delving into white nationalist black metal, which is its own kind of subculture that a lot of other black metal artists disavow. Even still, I think it has to be said, you can't just ignore that. A lot of black metal fans are Nazis, and that sucks. So things like murder, debauchery on that level, suicide, church burnings, were all just parts of what black metal was about. Specifically, all of those things apply to Mayhem, one of the darkest, most messed up groups of all time. They've really risen to a level of infamy that few other bands can even try and Initially getting their name from a Venom song called Mayhem and Mercy, so they formed in 1984 and released two EPs back then. Pure Fucking Armageddon was the first one, a lot of people love it, and one of my favorite releases by them, one of their more famous ones, was Death Crush, which came soon after that. However, their real history as a band wouldn't start until about 1988, when they were joined by a new vocalist named Dead from Sweden. He's one of the most important figures in the founding and growth of black metal music, 
he was the first person to truly use corpse paint in the way that kind of it grew to be used in black metal. His belief was that, you know, he was dead on the inside and he wanted to reflect that with his outward appearance. It wasn't some kind of stage presence, theatrics, glam thing like groups like Kiss had done before. This was really his kind of outward expression of how he felt. While performing, Dead would oftentimes cut himself on stage with pieces of broken glass or knives, and the band would usually have pig or sheep skulls just spiked on pillars at the top of the stage. Beyond just being a concert, it was a ritual at that point. This is when we really start to see the black metal musical style that we now know today. Noise and shrieking kind of vocals, dense, dense walls of sound that are just overbearing. But Mayhem would not have grown to be the group that the world knows them as, and black metal as a genre I think would not be as infamous were it not for Dead joining. But if you know anything about black metal, you know that soon after this, Dead actually ended up killing himself. He felt dead on the inside, and I think that, I mean, eventually it was just too much and he shot himself in the head. And this is where the big controversy really starts with the band. So after Dead was dead, there were really two camps here defined by Euronymous and Necro Butcher. Necro Butcher was just insanely distraught upon losing such a dear friend to himself and actually left the group. Euronymous, on the other hand, thought it would be a great idea to take a picture of Dead's corpse and use it for the cover of their new EP coming out. You can imagine how well that sat with Necro Butcher. Uh, okay, I can just tell you it now because I hold it in for many years, but actually I was on my way down to kill him myself. On August 10th in 1993, Varg was making his way to Euronymous' home. So unlike the movie Lords of Chaos would have you believe, Euronymous was not hanging out with Sky Ferreira this night. In fact, he had no girlfriend whatsoever. And Varg was making his way to his house with the very clear intent of killing him. Varg stabbed Euronymous 23 times. Very clearly a murder of passion or hate or whatever you want to call it. Varg was charged with a maximum sentence in Norway. In prison he recorded a lot of his music as Burzum that we now know of and he's been releasing has been releasing more music since then. And to this day now Necro Butcher has picked up the reins and Mayhem has continued to make music. So there's a lot to digest there and I also only covered the big parts of the history of Mayhem. So now I give you all my Mayhem cocktail, Pagan Fears. This will also be a stirred cocktail, so you will need some kind of glassware to stir it. First up is going to be honey syrup. Honey syrup is essentially just one part honey, one part water, and it's a much more simple way to get honey into a cocktail. Up next, I'm going to be using cherry hearing. It's a sweet cherry liqueur. Cherry hearing, while not technically Norwegian, Norwegian cherries are very well known for being delicious. So we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of this cherry hearing. In addition to being lovely and sweet and delicious, it also brings a nice reddish color like blood. I think perfectly fitting for this drink. Up next, creme de cassis. This is a liqueur made from black currants. It's a very dark berry, very common in Norway, Scandinavia, and many other places. Again, this is another dark, sweet liqueur, going super well with the cherry in there. Three quarters an ounce of this. The final main ingredient, we are gonna be using aquavit. If you don't know what aquavit is, I think the most simple way to explain it is to think of gin just made with botanicals besides juniper. Specifically, either dill or caraway. What the botanicals are will vary depending on region and where your aquavit is from. Swedish will use a lot more dill, whereas Norwegian will use caraway and it will be rested in sherry barrels for several months. Aquavit is very common during Christmas time, uh, uses kind of a celebratory liqueur that people take shots of. However, you will see some cocktails made with it as well. Linea is actually a pretty common bottle of Aquavit. What's interesting about this stuff too is that it has this whole shtick. A ship was headed from Norway to East Asia with a bunch of goods on it, one of them being just a bunch of barrels of Aquavit. When the Aquavit got there, the people didn't want it, so it made the return voyage back to Norway. Ever since then, every single bottle of Linea Aquavit has made that same voyage 
kind of as a part of the tradition, and it even shows the ship name. So here it says that it was the Tarago. Uh, it says M slash V. I don't know if that means it was the maiden voyage of the ship or not. We'll be using two ounces of this in our drink. The final ingredient for this cocktail is going to be something a little untraditional. You're going to use cuttlefish or squid ink. If you think back to, you know, Norwegian legend, the Vikings had a very fierce enemy in the Kraken. So you could just open the thing up right here, and it, oh my, <laughs> it smells like a beach. It smells briny. You get a bunch of fish wafting up at you. You know, that's fine if you're making some pasta with it or something like that. But just be aware, in the cocktail we're using such a small amount, all it's going to do is bring a little bit of saline in there, a little bit of saltiness that will actually improve the cocktail, believe it or not. But my god! <laughs> so what I did, I put some of it into a bowl with water, I mixed it in there, and I have a little eyedropper of that. You can also add it to your mixing glass, but it's going to take much longer to mix that way. Now you're going to add one cube of ice to this, and we're going to stir it and strain it into our gob. So grab your strainer and strain into your glass of choice. Lastly, for the garnish, we're going to use a little cocktail spear and put some cherries on top. Now let me taste my pagan fears. That might be one of my favorite drinks I've made on this channel so far. You get a lot of that caraway and sherry from the Lina, but the cherry in there from the hearing and the black currant are such a perfectly balanced sweetness. And a little bit of honey on the tail end of it makes it just something so lovely to drink on. Aquavit cocktails can be really hard to make, so I went with a more sweeter side to it with this one, and I think it definitely paid off. That cherry goes so well with that caraway and the sherry. I think, given the way I constructed this, it's pretty true to black metal fashion. I think, honestly, any black metal fan could get behind this without getting too pissed off at me, but then again, you never know. So put on your favorite black metal record, Sit back and enjoy this cocktail with me. Pagan Fears.